Hi everyone, this is Duncan from the podcast Under the Stairs. This particular video you're checking out just now has the archival recording attached to it. The archival recording is from our podography, I think that's the term that we use, um, and it will feature reviews of movies that fall under the 88 Films Italian Collection series. Now, the vast majority of reviews we've done over the last five years have been in audio format and published on our RSS feed for the podcast. We are transitioning over to give you access to all those reviews right here on YouTube under a playlist. Now, we're doing that because we're about to do our first video recording of E88 Films Italian collection release, that being Tentacles. So there's plenty of opportunity to delve into the back catalogue of the reviews here. And if you like what you hear, then please hit subscribe on the channel, leave your comments below, and uh, check out the rich catalogue of over 1,200 episodes we have on podcasts under the stairs on any podcatching device or Spotify that you use. So stick around, enjoy the episode, and I'll speak to you very soon. Something awful's happened. Paolo! Paolo, what's going on? I saw a murder right under my window. Well, the woman was strangled to death, but she must have put up a fight before she was killed. Like the case of that girl some time back. She was found strangled in a meadow, and the killer was never caught. looking for a motive for her death. You know, a woman was murdered here. The same way your daughter was could be the same one. Certainly the person writing must be crazy, all right. <laughs> can I do? But it's possible that it's the same one. And for some obscure motive, he started to kill again. More than one person in the village has lost patience with you. The police will question me, and I... No, don't worry about it. Have you any reason to? That woman's very bad, you know. Why do you say that? She practices strange rites in her house. I think she used to blackmail clients in some way with those seances she held. In this case, the victim's house was rifled. Nothing was missing, though. We found his jewels and money all there. It's safer if you wait here. He's trying to kill me. He thinks I know him, but I didn't see anything. You understand? Powell, stop it! Stefan, my poor brother. Since you arrived, awful things have started. Here you found a hell. Ah! And welcome back. So, number two, this number two in the Italian collection is The Bloodstained Shadow, a.k.a. Solamente Nero. It was released in 1978 and the little blurb biog thing from 88 Films for the synopsis for the movie says The Canals of Venice might have been the basis for the red-coated killer in the classic Don't Look Now, but that feels like a mere warm-up for the knife play of The Bloodstained Shadow, a certified Jallo masterpiece. Directed by Antonio Bibdo, 
uh, he who had directed Watch Me When I Kill, and starring sensational Stefani Cassini from Suspiria, the story focuses on a slew of slayings that will point towards someone harbouring some particularly horrifying past secrets. With all the stylish black glove mayhem that the Italians specialise in, Bloodstained Shadow is a crimson caked crime thriller in the tradition of Dario Argento, and its classy charms more than warrant this amazing Blu-ray update. So the movie was directed by Antonio Bibdo, and like I said at the start of the episode, Bibdo has his previous jolly also in the 88 films Italian collection, so watch me when I kill will be a movie that we will be discussing some way down the line, but I'm very much looking forward to doing that one as well. He has a kind of rocky career as a, a director. He comes out the gate in 77 with Watch Me When I Kill, a movie that did, I think, surprisingly more success than was expected when it came out. Uh, 77 being the year of of kind of the, the on onslaught of people trying to copy and emulate Argento's Deep Red. Um, the movie generated enough buzz that he was pretty much greenlit to do another movie the following year. And if you do a bit of reading into the backstory of Bibdo, he was very much excited to do it, but didn't have anything lying around that could be adapted into another Jallo. And it was on the off chance that a friend of his who was married to a woman who wrote short stories, happened to come up with this idea, which would be the template for the Bloodstained Shadow. And with him on board, he kind of adapted it to make it into the movie that we get. And that movie came out in 78. Didn't make another movie for a few years. The one he did was certainly not in the genre that he's known for. And really the only other movie which kind of stands out in the, the seven movies that he is known to have directed is Blue Tornado, which is a weird, a very strange movie actually, which kind of like a cross between Top Gun and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And when I say it's like a cross between Top Gun, see if you see the artwork for the movie, it is blatantly ripped off of Top Gun. The font, the text, the styling, even the poster to an extent is very Top Gun-esque, but it tries to marry different genres, kind of splice them together with that kind of Close Encounters vibe kind of trickling through. It's actually not that great a movie. It's kind of wonderful in how absurd it is, but it's not a great movie. Uh, which brings me to the discussion at hand, which is the Bloodstained Shadow. Now, 1978 is certainly towards the... We're, we're well out with the, the range of what is known as the Golden Age of Jallo cinema, where we were getting such fantastic movies... Uh, from the likes of Lucio Fulci, Dario Argento, uh, Mario Bava, Sergio Martino, um, uh, uh, Aldo Lado. Uh, we were getting all these movies coming out that were really powerful murder mystery crime thrillers. Certainly Argento started taking them in a more kind of violent, sleazy sort of realm. Martino certainly helped push it that way as well, but... By about 73, 74, audiences were getting a bit cold to the genre, just purely because of the sheer volume. Think kind of early 80s American slashers. They were popular for quite a while, a good few years, about three, four years, and then audiences started to tire of them. There was just too many of them. And as a result, it really took Argento coming back to the, the fray and releasing Deep Red to start to twist them in more of a horror kind of leaning and Bloodstained Shadow isn't quite there it certainly leans back on the more traditional elements of the jelly it is heavily influenced by Fulci, Bavo, uh, Bava sorry, and um, Argento for sure and when watching Bloodstained Shadow you get this feeling that it takes a lot from something like Don't Torture a Duckling the Fulci movie and that it's set remote from Rome uh, this one against the backdrops of, of kind of Venice with the canal network and being kind of isolated out with. And um, yeah, it's for, out with that, it's your kind of standard um, Jallo. The funny thing about this movie is how many critics review it and kind of the reviews themselves feel like they're damning it with faint praise. You know, it's like a 
a competent Jallo. A movie that, you know, comes out at a time period where Jallos are not all that interesting, but does everything it needs to and no more. You know, these kind of these kind of compliments, so to speak, against the movie are almost, if you're looking between the lines, feel a bit detrimental, as if it's saying that was well, paint by numbers and nothing more. I think there's quite a bit to celebrate in Bloodstained Shadow, but it certainly has quite a lot of flaws. The first one that I would lean on is purely the length of the movie. This is a long movie. It's about an hour and 45 minutes long in the 88 films cut, but by God, do you feel those, you know, one hour 45 minutes? It drags its heels in some places and the tone and the, the kind of texture of the movie is beautiful to look at, but the story plods and meanders in sections where our character is starting to unravel the mysteries of what might be behind this slew of killings, but at the same time, there's plenty of time to be kind of playful, ride boats, um, some banal conversations which don't lead anywhere and don't actually progress the plot of the murder mystery or the, inve or the investigation that far at all. And I think that's maybe one of the, the biggest detriments to the movie. The second is the, the characters themselves. Some characters feel like they've had time to be adapted, fleshed out, and, and certainly if we were once again using the kind of slasher comparison, there's a lot of archetypes in this movie. Uh, I'm not talking about like the blonde bimbo and the, the jock and the you know the, the stoner or anything like that but certainly when dealing with kind of rural or small town um, Italy the the way that the, the priest is portrayed is maybe not the best um, and there is a, a kind of count character in this one who is more than alluded to that he's, he's a paedophile um, and homosexual because that's that was a trope back then that you know if you're going to be homosexual chances are you're a paedophile as well it was very lazy writing and unfortunately it feels like there's a lot more time like a lot of the genre did and uh, there's a lot more time spent to make sure that shots are set up correctly and the you know uh, and the, the background is beautiful and maybe not a lot of time spent to developing and stretching out the characters. Uh, maybe more into the world of realism than the, the, the kind of world of tired tropes. That being said, on the flip side, I actually really like the murder mystery itself. I think it's handled quite well. I don't think it's obvious in the movie who the killer is um, until quite a bit in the movie. I think it, it sets up plenty of, of red herrings. And even then, this movie very ballsily opens with a scene which at first doesn't feel like it relates to anything. Um, we we zoom in at the very start of the movie with a, a girl being attacked and murdered by a man in a, in, in a holy garb, so to speak. And at the very end of the movie, it relates back to explain what that is. But we see that sequence and then we don't really think about it afterwards. Our interest isn't quite there and when it is there... It sets up a, a very convincing red herring. Uh, we have a, a character who is returning back to his hometown to visit his brother, who is the local priest. And when he arrives there, he finds that so much of the town has remained the same, but so much of it as well has moved on. Uh, and very early in the movie, the priest is awoken on a dark and stormy night, because we like them in horror movies. And looking out the window, he sees a local psychic, a mystic uh, who conducts his seances in the area be strangled to death by a cloaked uh, killer wearing black gloves. So that's our jally kicking into full gear with some of the, the, the ticks on the... If you've got a jally scorecard, like a bingo card, you can start ticking them off in the movie. Well, he witnesses the murder and um, the, the mystery unfolds from there. Because the priest has seen the murder, he starts receiving these notes which um, are threat well, threatening <laughs> notes um, that come through anonymously and as the viewer, as the audience member, we are led to believe that this is because he has seen the murder, that the murderer is threatening him, but that's actually 
the another red herring that the movie sets up, which I kind of get behind. I think that's pretty cool. As the movie goes along, more prominent members of the community are are kind of killed off uh, one by one in increase, uh, increasingly gruesome ways. And uh, Stefano, uh, brother of uh, the, the Paolo, the priest, starts kind of investigating into this. He does it with his uh, his new girlfriend that he meets when he comes back, Sandra. And I think this kind of is where the movie falls over a little bit. I love how when you watch um, something like Deep Red, uh, specifically if you watch the, the Italian cut of Deep Red, you get the, the romance uh, between Daria Nicolodi and David Hemmings' character. I think that's, that's really cool. It's actually one of the things I really enjoy about the longer Italian cut. Um, this movie tries to copy that a little bit uh, and sets up this kind of romance slash investigation couple of um, Stefano and Sandra, which slows the pacing down when we get these series of scenes where they're off doing stuff that couples would do, whether it's taking a boat journey or having something to eat or kind of lounging around and speaking to each other. I think these things predominantly are like anchors on the plot. We get a murder, the investigation kicks off, we get excited, we're going to spend time with them as they frolic around, that's the anchor in the plot. Then there's another murder, we're going to increase the mystery, we're going to increase the the attention we start paying to the clues and then there's a bit more romance anchor in the ground again to the plot it does that quite a bit um, the murders themselves are related through uh, through the investigation back to uh, a case where a young girl was murdered and it was unsolved um, weirdly enough this is the the clip we saw at the start of the episode, uh, right at the beginning of the movie, if you've been paying attention. Uh, so yeah, um, and what we eventually find out through investigation, and this is a huge spoiler, but we're going to be spoiling these movies um, on all these episodes, uh, is the, the, the girl who died at the beginning was killed by the, the priest himself, Paolo, the brother of uh, Stefano. And we kind of continue following this through and we eventually find out, you know, it's Paolo that's done it and when the priest is confronted, he ultimately kills himself and that's the end of the movie. So, I mean, what... As stories go, it's a lot more linear than a lot of Jally. Um, I do like the reveal, to be honest with you. I like the reveal of who the killer actually is, which I will not give away. Um... And I like the fact that this, you know, what well, as a repressed memory to Stefano. Stefano saw his brother kill this girl, which once again links back into some of the tropes that we get that Argento set out when you look at something like Bird with the Crystal Plumage. This idea of a memory embedded, you know, a witness of a murder which is embedded in the back of your head, which over time you start to, when you piece things together, starts to come back into your vision. It's fully realised. And then from there, you know, obviously, you you then get your reveal at the end who the killer is. Um, I find that I find that aspect pretty pretty fun in the movie and quite unexpected. I also think the killings are done really well. There's a there's a certain viciousness, um, whether it's the the, the kind of hand strangulation, the, the old school jelly method, or a character actually being impaled on a, a spear like device. Uh, in his uh, chateau. I think that's handled really well. There is a creepiness about the, the kind of paedophilic count character as well, which is kind of wonderful in the movie, as the guy plays it perfectly, that kind of sleaze element. The, the fact that the priest kind of tries to warn that there have been reports of certain actions. The fact that we're introduced to that character as he is creepily and nonsally hovering over the back of this small boy who's playing the piano uh, and comment how wonderful he is. And, oh, it just is. It, it schemes me out just a little bit. That being said, like I say, all that builds up quite well. It's just the 
the kind of counterpoints of the, the romantic side of the story, which I feel drag it back. I think you could easily chop 15 minutes out of this movie, 20, maybe even 25 minutes, and a kind of totter murder mystery is there to be filmed. It is beautifully shot. I mean, that is one thing we, we, we can we can all agree on when you watch this movie. When you sit down and, and get a, a, a full, full glare of it right in your face, it is wonderfully shot. Beautiful location. Um, I think most of it may have been shot in Venice uh, or the surrounding area. And that certainly comes off the back of A Don't Look Now, which, you know, Venice is... You could argue Venice is one of the characters in the movie, one of the predominant characters in the movie. I think as well you have this great kind of you have a wonderful score but I don't just want to say the movie's got scored really well because a lot of Jally of the time had that but there's this wonderful story uh, which if you've got an opportunity check out Troy Holworth's book um, So Deadly So Perverse Volume 2 which covers Jally from 1974 to 2013 uh, where he goes into a bit of detail about this movie and he mentions that the studio themselves couldn't afford Goblin, even though at the time Bibdo had kind of agreed in principle that Goblin would do the scoring. And as a result, they had to go elsewhere, but they worked out quite well in that Goblin actually took at least one of the pieces and reworked it. And you can hear that in the score. The main theme is, you know, it's, it's actually a great piece of music, uh, not only that it's, you know, composed elsewhere, but the fact that it has that Goblin vibe as well is really cool. It doesn't play too many times in the movie, but it doesn't have to. And the score is really good. The the dim side, ultimately, um, which I think is maybe what makes a lot of people damn it with faint praise by saying, you know, it's a, you know, it's, it's a decent jello or it's, you know, run-of-the-mill jello is ultimately what you get is that it doesn't really stray too far from the, the template of the standard jelly. It also is a bit too long. It also plays into too many stereotypes. But the kills are good. Visually, it's pleasing on the eye and it's scored well. So these become almost like counterpoints to each other in that when you are looking at a positive on one side, there is almost an equal corresponding negative that runs alongside the movie. I think it's definitely worth checking out, but I would throw some caveats in here for the Bloodstained Shadow. I think you need to be invested in the genre to watch it. I don't think if you were sitting down and asking me to do a list of 10 Jally movies to get you into the genre, the Bloodstained Shadow would be anywhere near that list. I think you need a grounding and better totter scripts and ideas first before you could approach something like this. That being said though, if you are an aficionado of the genre, if you like a bit of murder mystery and you are are, are more heavily invested in the Jally subgenre now, I think it's one that needs to be ticked off the list. There's certainly quite a lot going on here. What I like as well is you can see the progression from Watch Me When I Kill. Um, which was Bibdo's previous movie, which I have a lot of time for. I, I know it sometimes sometimes doesn't get enough credit, much like the Bloodstained Shadow, but I, I quite like that movie as well, even though it is a deeply flawed movie. You can see that he certainly had better cinematography here, a better idea of how to portray a story. The issue comes in with the length. Like I say, it could be, it could be chopped down quite a bit, and I don't think it would be... Um, all that bad at all. It's certainly for fans of people like Lado, for people like um, Argento, for Filci by all, by all means, um, but I would say Filci in Jally terms and not Filci as in the uh, kind of the Gates of Hell trilogy. But if you watch Don't Torture a Duckling, then whilst this movie is not a patch, on, on that masterpiece. I think it's certainly in the same sort of ballpark. Um, if you like Deep Red, whilst this movie is not a patch on Deep Red, it, t it ticks off a lot of scenes. There's a scene later on in the movie where he's in almost like a, a doll workshop, which doesn't feel that far removed from a scene in Deep Red, so you can, you can jump to that as well. Um, and it certainly takes on a lot of the, the kind of the style setups of, of a Bava without ripping off like 
you know, bold colour schemes, but there's certain camera setups um, which which are definitely within that ballpark as well. So yeah, I think it's if you are a fan of Jallies and you've never seen the Bloodstained Shadow before, I would say check it out. I don't think it's going to be one of these ones where you're like, I've, I found this lost masterpiece. It's not like that at all. It's, it's certainly, like a lot of the reviews say, it is a bit paint by numbers. It's a bit run of the mill. I think it's maybe got some atmosphere um, and, and certainly some of the killings that elevate it. The scenery, for all intents and purposes, makes it a, a very... A really, really good movie to watch. I think that's. I think it, it. It's just long, and that's my gripe with it. It's far, far, far too long for a movie of this sort. I mean, you watch even the longer cuts of Deep Red. At least Deep Red's got a lot going on in it. This movie suffers from too much quiet going on in there. So once you cut through that, though, I think, I think you dig it. Um, it's interesting to see, you know, when you watch it for the first time if you can pick out who the killer is or what the story is or if you can link it back to that first scene which basically sets out I mean it's obvious a priest is killing someone um, so why we don't think about that later on you know where one of our main characters is a priest I don't know as once again links back to that deep red shows you the killer at the start and you just don't piece it together um, if I was giving this one a grade I, I think it's going to be a 2.5 out of 5 I think I like it a little bit more than you know don't really like it um, but I'd be loath to say that I do actually like the movie I like elements of the movie I just think overall there there are issues which which bring it down so it's a 2.5 out of 5 from me